Greetings, everyone. My name is Joe Steinfield. Welcome to the third session in the second season of Stories to Share. Uh, let me acknowledge at the outset that in addition to all of you in the room, we have people participating online. Ed Watazek is our audio engineer, and uh, I'm hoping that those who are online will be able to participate. We're up to close to 10, and uh, we'll use the chat line. We're going to have time for questions, audience participation. I'm pretty sure if ever we had one of these get-togethers where you're going to have questions, comments, uh, maybe even issues, uh, today's the day. Our speaker <laughs> Mark Beckwith became an Episcopal was ordained in the Episcopalian Church in 1980 and uh, was the rector at congregations in New Jersey and in Worcester Mass and then became the Bishop of Newark, New Jersey and he held that post for about a dozen years, starting in 2007. Now, from what I understand, being the Bishop of New Jersey is a full-time job. <laughs> Not for this man, who has managed to do more than one can imagine in any 24-hour day. Uh, he has appeared a number of times on Good morning, Joe. For those of you who occasionally go on MSNBC, he's been on various PBS programs. Interestingly, he had a talk show uh, in New Jersey, but he wasn't alone. It was Bishop Beckwith, an imam, and a rabbi. That sounds like the beginning of a joke, but anyway. <laughs> And Mark has also founded or co-founded numerous organizations, uh, one of which was a homeless shelter, uh, another the Newark Interfaith Coalition for Hope and Peace. I could get behind that. Uh, Bishops United Against Gun Violence and an organization called Braver Angels. That's in addition to being the bishop. And he's written a book that is here. It's this book, Seeing the Unseen. This is not a book reading. We do not sell books here. But if anyone is interested in the book, you'll be able to talk to Mark afterwards and make some sort of arrangement. They are for sale. It's a great pleasure. Uh, an honor, really, to have Mark here. He now lives in Jaffrey, so I introduce Mark Beckwith. Uh, thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And can we thank Joe for this vision, which brings people together on a monthly basis and for all the things that Joe does? Joe, thank you. And uh, Becca Fredrickson from the Civic Center, who has offered this space for all of us. I appreciate that. And I also want to give a shout out to Bob Beck, who introduced me to Joe Steinfeld. So uh, Bob, uh, uh, you are the instigator for me being here this evening. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, uh, but use that as a springboard to talk about some other issues that uh, my guess is we all are talking about or thinking about in our lives. And uh, the origin of my writing this book um, came from my time in uh, the Diocese of Newark. I was the Bishop of, of Newark and our office was right downtown uh, overlooking the lovely Passaic River. And uh, I was there and uh, <clears throat> I started there in 2007, and I noticed the first few days that I was there that there was a soup line, an outdoor soup kitchen, 
uh, that attracted a lot of men. And I paid attention to that because I had started soup kitchens, worked in soup kitchens, started shelters. But after two or three weeks, I did not notice these men showing up at lunch anymore. Why? Because I was on the fourth floor of my office looking out all over northern New Jersey and the hundred congregations that I was responsible for, seeing their, their issues, their concerns, their hopes, their troubles, and that was where my attention lay. So the point where I didn't see these guys showing up twice a day. They just faded into the woodwork, not the woodwork, into the river bank of the Passaic River. I was three or four years into my ministry there and a priest in the diocese, a woman, came up to me and asked, what goes on next door? And I said, well, there's a soup, soup kitchen. She said, let's go. Uh, and so a group of us went next door, not to serve, but to hear stories, to hear stories. And uh, what I found out was that there were 500 men a day coming at 250 in the morning, 250 at, at noon, and I didn't see them. I didn't see them. I was blind to who they were. And as uh, we debriefed from this first meeting and having conversations with most of these guys who were homeless, but not all of them, and uh, they had either been kicked to the curb because of, uh, of their race or their uh, class, uh, or they had kicked themselves to the curb because of their mental health issues or their addiction or whatever. And as we debriefed our time with these guys, this woman stuck her finger in my chest and she said, don't you dare go just once. Uh, so I didn't. I went every week uh, for the next several years. Uh, sometimes it was a drive-by on my part, you know, I spent a, just a few moments, but I developed some relationships uh, with these guys who I didn't see. And uh, I developed relationships with them. And what I learned from many of them, they lived with a level of courage and faith that had never been tested to that degree in me. And I remember developing a relationship with one guy named Al, who had gone to Boston University. And I don't know why he didn't finish, although I have some ideas. Uh, and he and I developed a relationship, and we t uh, told each other what we were reading. And he told me uh, he was reading James Joyce. And I looked at him, I said, no, you're not. Uh, nobody can read James Joyce. Uh, I've tried, I can't get through. Oh, I love James Joyce. And uh, he says, well, what are you reading, Mark? And I said, well, I'm reading this new book uh, by Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, called Between the World and Me, about an African-American man writing to his nephew. And Al looks at me. Um, and I said, uh, who's an African-American guy my age, and I said, he says that the American dream is built for people like me on the backs of people like you. And he looks at me and he goes, you didn't know that. <laughs> and I did, but I didn't know it to the level that Al knew it. And so that opened my eyes uh, and to these many men who came every day, every day, morning and noon, and uh, began to develop relationships, hear their stories, and try and work through my own blindness. And as you might imagine, all these guys, uh, and they were mostly men, there were some women, and they were, uh, they were fed inside, uh, and there were fewer of them, but all these guys were outside. Uh, and all of them, at some level, were financially poor. Uh, they were financially poor. Many of them were homeless. Some of them camped on the banks of the Passaic River. Some lived in SROs. Uh, many of them were in and out of shelters, in and out of jail, uh, a lot of nomadic life going on. And they were poor. And I reflected on that, and I looked back at Scripture, actually, uh, in the New Testament. Jesus would often refer to the poor. Uh, the poor, and when he said that, and we use that term, the poor, over and over again, uh, we are um, not uh, making note of the fact that they have names and they have stories. So when we re refer to people, the poor, we are sort of putting them into a category and leaving them there and keeping our distance from them because they are poor. 
So I've tried to train myself to talk about people who are financially poor as opposed to people who are emotionally poor or spiritually poor or some other kind of poor. And what, uh, another way this was brought home to me uh, was when I was in college, Bill Russell of the Boston Celtics, he had retired by that point, came to address the student body. And uh, uh, he was incredibly elegant, uh, six foot 10, but even more elegant in what he had to say. And he told the story about being in an airport at one point and uh, he, you know, obviously stands out, 6'10", arguably one of the five best basketball players ever to play the game. And a woman walks up to him and says, oh, you're a basketball player. And he looks at her and he says, very graciously but clearly, he said, no, madam, I am a man who plays basketball. His humanity came first. And we typically identify people by category and by virtue of doing that, deny them uh, their, their humanity. And we often don't see that or pay attention to that. So uh, I've been uh, training myself to adjust my language. And another place that I'm training myself uh, to adjust language is in the whole area of mission. In the Christian tradition, and actually all the world religions have a mission a mission and speaking mostly about the Christian tradition, which is where I come from and I'm still very much a part of, mission four or 500 years ago was the idea of bringing God to places where God is not. Think of that for a moment. Think of the arrogance of that. Uh, and, but that is often what is done. And the idea is when we bring uh, God, or have the idea that we're bringing God to places where God is not, the intention is we're gonna make the people that we meet become like us. And uh, there's a horrendous history in this country of you know, uh, kidnapping essentially Native American kids and putting them in schools and denying them of their language, their culture, and their heritage. Make them like us. So I think we've moved in many ways beyond that notion of mission, uh, that we bring what we have to places where there is nothing, but there's still sort of this subtle notion, mission is doing for, doing for someone else. And sometimes that's incredibly necessary and, and required. If people don't have a place to live, you need to find them a place to live. If they don't have uh, food, you need to provide them food, same thing with their clothing, the basic needs in life to do for. But what often happens is that is the extent to where we go and it reinforces the gap between those who are giving and those who are receiving. And so the challenge is to move from doing for to being with. And what I tried to do when I went next door to this soup line is to be with. Now granted, there was something artificial about it. I had a purple shirt, I, I uh, work in a big, big uh, office building. Um, I had a lot of accoutrements that I'm not wearing today, you know, these uh, uh, bishop accessories, all of that, and I got to go home. Um, so it was different, but it was the attempt to be with. And I wanna tell a story from the New Testament that speaks to this, that I think, uh, I have had my eyes opened up to, and indeed the story uh, sort of suggests that. It's the story, one of the Easter stories. It happens on Easter Day, and two followers of Jesus, they're not disciples, they're followers of Jesus, are going to Emmaus. And why are they going to Emmaus? Because they need to get out of Jerusalem. Their leader's been killed and, uh, and tortured. They figure they're going to be next. So we're getting out of town. And they walk out of town, they meet a stranger, the reader knows that it's the risen Jesus, but the followers of Jesus don't know that. This is a stranger. And he asked them rather coyly, what, what's happened? You seem all upset. And uh, as if he didn't know. And they say, well, our leader has been arrested. He was tortured. He was killed. And now some women told us that he's come back to life again. This is too much for us. We're going to Emmaus. And he asked, can I go with you? And so they say, sure. So they walk the seven miles to Emmaus. And by the end of this seven mile trek, they've developed a relationship. 
And so the two followers of, G uh, uh, of Jesus, who again, they don't know who this person is, they ask him, will you be our guest? And he says, sure. So they go into the inn, clean up, come down to dinner, come down to dinner. And as the story reports it, Jesus takes the bread and breaks it. And in that moment, they recognize him and he disappears. Now, in many ways, that story should not have been played out the way it is described. Because the two hosts, if you will, the followers of Jesus could have said, should have said, no, 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 no. We're the hosts. We break the bread. You are our guest. It's when you allow the guest to be the host, eyes can be opened. And we live in a culture which sort of trains us uh, to have closed eyes to not see the men uh, who are assembling uh, day after day, week after week, next door. There are all sorts of things uh, that we don't see. Our attitudes, I think, are bolstered by prejudice, which is rooted in fear. And we all learned prejudice somehow, somewhere. All of us did. At the dinner table, on the playground, maybe in a religious community, maybe in school, maybe somewhere, but we all learned it. We all learned it. And to say that we didn't learn it, uh, I say to people, you need to think again. You learned it. And the challenge is not to get rid of it, but where did it come from? How does it operate? When does it show up? And how do we manage it? We either learned racial, regional, religious, relational, educational, or economic prejudice, and that's just part of the list. We need to learn where it comes from and how to manage it. And our prejudices are heightened by a level of fear and augmented these days, especially, I, I love and hate this term, the conflict entrepreneurs that we have uh, in media uh, who are saying things just to get us all riled up and to get us to sort of get reconnected with those prejudices because in some ways it works. And we live with incredible political polarization, the likes of which I've never experienced in my lifetime. And uh, my guess is that's the case for most, if not all of us here this afternoon. There are several ways out of this that I want to talk about. One is, ta-da, Ed? OK. The big button? Oh, the big button. I didn't press on the big button. There, there it is, OK. This is a mandorla, a mandorla. Uh, M-A-N-D-O-R-L-A. -A. It's the Italian word for almond. It's the shape that's created when two circles intersect. Think of Venn diagram from sixth grade math. Remember that? Sixth grade math, the two circles intersect. Now, medieval art has lots of depictions of mandorla. Not a halo, which is over the head, but people within the mandorla. It's the space that's created when two circles intersect. In medieval art, the two circles are heaven and earth. Now you can apply this, and I apply it, to our current situation, which is the tension or the intersection between red and blue, mm -hmm. between conservative and progressive. And uh, the mandorla is, um, these are two circles that can never be separated and can never overlap. And the mandorla is a space that one can enter, but it takes risk to go there, because you don't really know what's going to happen, and you have to let go of some of the assumptions and prejudices that we bring into it. And it's a place of common ground, place of common ground. A place uh, or a movement that is claiming that mandorla, to my mind, is the organization called Braver Angels. How many know of Braver Angels? Many of you do. Um, initially called Better Angels, formed after the 2016 election and named at, uh, or drawing on the words from Lincoln's first inaugural address, appealing to the better angels of our nature. 
And the idea was recognizing that America is deeply polarized. What can we do about this? Well, we can invite people into a mandorla, into a space, not to pull one side to the other, but is there a place that we can find common ground? And in 2016, after that election, the first uh, Braver Angels gathering happened in uh, South Lebanon, Ohio, uh, with 11 Trump voters and 10 Clinton voters. And they spent the day together in a facilitated conversation process uh, by the head of the Marriage and Family Department at uh, the University of Minnesota. And since then, there have been over three or 4,000 similar types of converse conversations, bringing people together out of difference, again, not to try and pull one side to the other, but can we find common ground? Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, uh, in two weeks in New Hampshire will be the second gathering of le state legislators in New Hampshire um, uh, facilitated by Braver Angels. Six Republicans and six Democrats who have agreed to do this, to enter into the Mandorla, facilitated by the, uh, the author of these various uh, uh, options, uh, to see how we can, how they, we can work in a more harmonious way. Again, not to pull one side to the other, but recognizing and honoring some, uh, uh, some norms that people can live by, and to live into them uh, in a way that I think is, uh, is, Im is important. Now, <clears throat> the, the intention is to seek common ground, which is different than compromise. Many people, when I talk about this, they say, oh gosh, if I do this, I'm going to be abandoning my positions or betraying my side. And uh, when in fact, it's, it's finding common ground. The more that I do this, and I work particularly around political polarization and around gun violence prevention, the more I engage in people on the other side, the stronger I'm holding on to my, my own positions but the more willing and able I am to be engage in conversation in this space of common ground. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I am an Episcopal bishop. Uh, Episcopal has its roots in the Anglican tradition, uh, the Church of England. And uh, I mention this because the Church of England was formed in the mid uh, 16th century as uh, in the tension between Protestantism and Catholicism. And if we think polarization is difficult today, it's nothing <laughs> compared to what it was then. And so and if an Episcopalian is asked, oh, are you Protestant or Catholic? We glibly say yes, <laughs> uh, because we're a little bit of both. And, and we have claimed that tension, that tension between one side and the other. And when you enter into that tension and take the risk and the vulnerability and requiring the humility involved, things can emerge. New ways forward can emerge. Uh, and so that, that I think is, is very important um, for us today to be able to seek common ground. Uh, interestingly enough, a way that this was played out, uh, and some of you may know more about this than, than I do, is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa that Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Tutu, headed up. And uh, when apartheid ended, there was uh, initially the intention that they had to litigate all the abuses. And it was thought that if they did that, we'd still be doing it some 30 years later mm -hmm. and be going on for another 30 years. And the enmity wouldn't have any, any, uh, uh, any way of uh, abating. And what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did is invited people to tell their stories, to tell their stories. And uh, it was a risk. Uh, it still is a risk. The jury is still out if it worked uh, or not. I like to think that it did. And it had uh, two people sort of uh, championing it, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, who at the time uh, were perhaps the most important uh, reconcilers uh, on the planet. Uh, and people were telling their stories and moving through, moving through just 
all the awfulness of that time uh, that that country experienced. The key is telling stories, listening to stories, and listening to stories. When I say listening to stories, if I'm encountering somebody who has a different opinion than me, and they're telling me their position, invariably, and I know I'm not alone here, I'm fashioning my response. I am not listening. And so the issue is really to listen to see where that person comes from, where, where is their heart, where are their values, and is there a place, is there a place that we can uh, find common ground. All of this is what I've talked to is, uh, applies to guns. And I first got involved in the gun violence prevention movement uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. December 14th will be the 10th anniversary of the Newtown shooting. Uh, and so many people in this movement, uh, that was the catalyst that, that got them going. And uh, I had identified three other bishops who were interested in reducing gun violence. I was in Newark, one was in Chicago, one was in Milwaukee, and the other guy was in Baltimore. And then Newtown happened, and all these other bishops wanted to get involved. And now we have a network of 100 bishops across the country, uh, not just on the coast, but all over the country, doing what we can to reduce the incidence of gun violence. And yes, uh, trying to reform gun laws. Uh, and one, one thing I've learned, and this relates to what I said earlier about the poor, uh, and to be more specific or be, be uh, more honoring of where people are. Uh, early on in my work around gun violence prevention, uh, I said to somebody who I now know well, and he'd been in this field for, for 20 years. His brother had been killed um, uh, in, in a gun violence incident. Uh, he was an FBI agent and he was murdered in his office. And I said, gun control, and he slapped me on the wrist. We knew each other somewhat. And he said, please don't use that term. Please don't use that term. Because when you use the term gun control, it lines people on, up, up, uh, on other opposite sides of the room and conversation just stops. And it devolves to the issue of the Second Amendment and uh, uh, Joe's the lawyer here, I am not, and my experience is that just those conversations don't go anywhere. Use the term gun safety. Use the term gun safety. Because when you use the term gun control with someone who is a gun owner, they immediately think you want to take away my guns. Want to take away my guns. And uh, uh, that's, um, <clears throat> that's an issue, and I learned about this in a very powerful way um, uh, about four years ago, I went to a gun show in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, I walked in this gun show and there are all these men, uh, maybe there are a few women, mostly these men, a lot of antique guns. And uh, the one that I saw that was most expensive was $25,000. They're collectors of these guns. Uh, some go back to the Revolutionary War. Uh, but then there were more modern accessories to guns, and people were there looking at all these accessories, holsters and ammunition and all this kind of stuff. And I'm listening to the conversations, and I have no idea what they're talking about. No idea what they're talking about. Not that they're not talking English, but they're using terms that I don't know. It would be like me saying to a non-football fan, uh, uh, we got to do the package uh, defense and we have to have the stunts and you know all the kind of technical language around football that most people don't understand. I didn't know what they were talking about. And what I realized as I'm in this gun show is these people who were there, uh, the gun owners, and they, were, they felt safe um, in this space, is that, oh God, this is a part of American culture that has been there from the beginning from the beginning. There's a part of me and perhaps a part of you who would just like to get rid of guns. Well, to folks who have guns and have been part of the gun culture, that's getting rid of their culture. You can't do that. You can't do that. And I realized as I was walking through this that, that I come at this issue with a level of arrogance, smugness, and self-righteousness that just ticks off the other side. And most, and I was not aware of it. I was, most of us are not aware of the arrogance, shame, uh, the shame that we inflict 
on people who come at issues from the other side. And it just causes them to double down. Uh, we need to honor that culture. Uh, and uh, what I've discovered also in the gun violence prevention movement, uh, and I want to call out New Hampshire in this regard, is that a way to find common ground is on the issue of suicide. Over half of gun deaths in America are, su uh, uh, are suicide. And in New Hampshire, it's about 80%. Why is that? Because the gun laws are uh, less restrictive here uh, in New Hampshire as opposed to Massachusetts, where I used to live, where the suicide rate is much less. And uh, there's a group of us that has um, met for a long, long time, I'm a uh, latecomer to this group, called the New Hampshire Firearm Safety Coalition, and meet at the Manchester Firing Range. And it's a group of gun shop owners and gun trainers and public health officials and people like me who are working together to see if we can reduce the incidence of gun suicide because it's in everybody's self-interest to do so. And so here are these people who otherwise have very different opinions about guns and how we should use them and who should have them and all the rest of it, but working on that area, in that area. So I think that's, uh, uh, and the first uh, New Hampshire Firearm Safety Coalition is the first of its kind in the country, and it's been replicated in several other states. And New Hampshire can take uh, some pride in that. Uh, that is one area, I find, uh, where there is possibility of working together. The last thing I want to talk about, and then open up the conversation, if this works, okay, is to talk about the diffusion of innovation. <laughs> yeah, the diffusion of innovation. Uh, this is a, um, a title of a book by Everett Rogers. It was published in 1962. He then taught at Ohio State University. And he talks about the diffusion of innovation, that if you want to change a culture, uh, you need 18 to 21 percent of that culture. If you have less than that, the culture reverts back to homeostasis. And so, and he has this bell curve. You see here innovators uh, who come up with an idea. This is not uh, on any issue that we can think about. Any issue, innovators. And oftentimes, innovators get stuck there because they innovate, but they haven't taken the next step to get the early adopters. And that's not enough. You need to get the, some in the early, uh, early majority, because if you don't have 18 to 21 percent, if you get all the innovators and early adopters, that's 16 percent. The data su suggests that's not enough to change a culture. You need 18 to 21 percent. Now with guns and the gun violence uh, issue that we have, and I mean uh, maybe many of you saw this last week in the New York Times, uh, America has 4 percent of the uh, world's population and 42% of the guns. And the a gun rate death in America is 33 per million people. In Canada, it's five per million people. And in Great Britain, it's 0.7 per million people. We got a problem. How do we deal with this? I suggest that one way, in addition to all the uh, 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 um, reforms that are necessary, red flag laws, limited capacity, reducing or getting rid of assault weapons, background checks, all of those things are so important. But if we really want to change the culture, it has to come within that gun culture to get 18 to 21 percent of them to, uh, to want to change. Now we know, and I think this data is accurate, 70% um, uh, of gun owners are willing to engage in background checks. Now, on this bell curve on the other end, you have laggards. 
They're the people who dig in their heels, no way. We got laggards in the gun industry. It's called the NRA and the Sports Shooting Federation. And they are incredibly effective. Um, incredibly effective of being laggards and making sure that nothing ever moves to 18 to 21 percent. And I think the real challenge, the challenge is, is, to, is to be in relationship, to see people uh, uh, who are part of the gun culture, gun culture, build relationships and invite them into a different way of seeing. That's very, very difficult. It's going to take a long, long time. And uh, I just, um, uh, I think we have to see these issues in a different way. Let me stop there and invite any comments, questions, refutations, critiques. Um, uh, uh, Bob Beck said he had his tomatoes ready should he need to fire them. So. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, First, we'll start in the room. Raise your hand and then please stand and go ahead. Yes, yes, stand up and you can use the mic up here, I believe, yes? Yeah, and your name? I'm Sally Archer. Hi, Sally. And I reside here in Jaffray. I've been here for about a year and I moved from a state that many people would presume to have severe gun culture. Mm. I must admit that every time I heard those two words put together, gun culture, I grimaced. Mm. Because what I learned in that state of Alaska, okay, that it is a culture of self-protection. Mm -hmm. Let me expand on that a little bit. There are many, many people in Alaska who must their family. In order to do that, there are all sorts of civic organizations to, to train and apply safety to the use of guns. That's Fish and Game, it's the Boy Scouts, it's mm -hmm. the Girl Scouts, it's 4-H. It's within the culture. Now, in regard to self-protection, that's self-protection for the family, mm -hmm. okay, for the the gun user's family, but it's also a very male-dominated culture up there. So a lot of it is self-protection or the protection of the, of, uh, the perception that if I don't have a gun, as my generational ancestors did in settling this country, Alaska and the lower 48, then I'm risking my liberty. Sure. So it's really, really closely woven. Mm -hmm. I think there are many other states, Montana, Wyoming, um, Idaho, even New Hampshire. But if we can break it down and bring it into the person, what is that person feeling if he or she is, is without a gun? Sure. Look at all the risk that is manifested. Mm -hmm. So yes. I just want to thank you. I appreciate that. that. And and I've done a couple of podcasts, um, one with Braver Angels and one with a couple of other folks. Uh, um, one was um, University of Southern California with uh, gun rights owners. And I say gun culture, and they um, the response is, well, which gun culture? They're hunters. There's there's urban guns. There are target shooters, um, there's military, and there's Hollywood. And self-defense. And self-defense, all of those things. So which gun culture is it? Mm -hmm. And uh, we sort of put it all like the poor. Gun culture is, mon it isn't. And that's something that I've learned. And also somebody, I remember going to a conference and uh, somebody who was a hunter uh, described a situation where he was hunting with a friend of his and they had to cross a fence <laughs> And uh, this guy uh, unloaded his gun, and his friend did not. And after they crossed the fence, uh, this person who's relating the story to me said, remind me never to go hunting with you again, because he wasn't safe enough. And some of the people who are most committed to safety are people who own guns.
And uh, you know, there's this this uh, sort of swirl of of thought that it's everybody has the same position. And my experience is that's not the case. And uh, there's there's a way to to find common ground. Thank you. Ed, anybody on the chat line yet? Oh. All right. Who else? Yes. Please yes. Stand up. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Thank you for for the presentation. My name is Ned Almey, and I'm from all the way from Peterborough. But um, <laughs> just reflecting on on your comment of how we otherize, how we mm -hmm. learn discrimination, and you know, I just just would love to get your 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 kind of some more thoughts on this. I mean, I felt like even growing up in New London, which is where I grew up, we would otherize the kids from the other town. You know, we would otherize the kids when we would play against, you know, Peter Sarge against Convent. And my wife and I, you know, uh, we travel around the world a lot, live in a lot of different countries. You know, the Costa Ricans otherized the Nicaraguans. They were the poor, you know, let's build a wall on our front on our frontier against the Nicaraguans who didn't want them coming to your country. You know, a lot of the a lot of the folks in South America, they want to build a wall against the Peruvians. You know, it's it's the people on the other town, the other city, the other side of the train track in your own town. How can we work to, to unlearn that and to not teach that? Well, I think, uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, I don't know that we can unlearn it. I think we need to learn where it comes from. And one place where it comes from, sort of indirectly and not intentionally, uh, are the original observations of Yom Kippur in the Jewish tradition. And uh, in the early, early years of, uh, of uh, Jewish tradition with the temple, uh, a, um, a goat would be um, presented to the high priest who would take it into the Holy of Holies. And the goat would have all sorts of scurrilous things written on it. Uh, all of people's sins, all of their anger, all of their, their uh, distress would be written on the goat. The priest would then take the goat and throw it out of the city uh, where it was expected it would be devoured by priests. The original scapegoat. That's where scapegoat comes from. Now the Jewish uh, families move way, way, way beyond that, but we have not. And there's a, a, a philosopher, Rene Girard, who died about 20 years ago, French philosopher, uh, who talked about this, and he said, uh, he wrote that scapegoat always works because it reduces the anxiety in a community for a while. And then the anxiety comes back up again, so what needs to happen? Either you beat down the same scapegoat or you find somebody else. So we've always been in the business of finding scapegoats. And uh, <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about. Go back to the um, cafeteria in middle school. <laughs> um, there were scapegoats. Remember those kids that you know, you'd never sit near? Because if you sat near them, uh, your social life was ruined forever, or so you thought as a 14-year-old. I mean, we all did that. We all did that. And there are, uh, I'd like to think that there are religious practices, the Jewish, Christian, and Muslims are the ones that I know the best, that have practices and designs to move people away from scapegoating, yet, understanding that it comes from uh, a, a, a very um, uh, ancient place. Uh, it's archetypal. You know, we put, build ourselves up, we need to put, put somebody else down. Um, and, uh, and that works for a while, but it never works in the long run. And I think it's important for each of us to know where did that come from? Um, you know, where in New London did you learn this? Um, on the good where, side of the tracks. Yeah, on the good side of the tracks, yeah. Yeah. Where, uh, in the North Shore of Chicago, did I learn it where I spent or my early years? I mean, we all learned it somewhere. And, and to see how it operates uh, and when it gets triggered. Ah, bad word. When it gets catalyzed. Uh, I try not to use that, that verb. But um, where, where it gets set off. Where it get, how it gets set off, and what we need to do. And I think um, communities can help with that. And uh, I'm, a, as you might imagine, a great proponent of religious communities because I think they're designed 
uh, to, at least theoretically, to minimize that. That said, we all know, or I, I assume we all know, there are lots of religious traditions uh, or communities that are interested in control, and one way to control is to put somebody else down. Uh, you know, it happens. What a wonderful word, to otherize. <laughs> is it in the dictionary? I'm not sure. I'll take credit for it, though. Well, <laughs> I, I, Nicholas Kristof for the uh, New York Times uses othering a lot. I intend to use it, and I'm also going to take credit for knowing where scapegoat comes from. Thank you for that. Uh, who's next? Please. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bob Pettigrew. I come, live in Peterborough. There was something that just struck me like a ton of bricks, which, which I guess is supposed to be obvious, but isn't. When you talked about those two things on the last chart. Right. About everybody has their own particular thing that's mm -hmm. important. And uh, it, it, to me, it's so easy to per pursue in whatever you're doing that particular mm -hmm. place there. And it just struck me, and I think it's probably obvious to everybody, but you know, if you overlap those two things, there's got to be something in there that is common to the two. Mm -hmm. And, and that, you know, I mean, that really just struck me. It's huge. Yes. But thank you for bringing that up because that, that's, that's a wonderful guideline for just living and working with other people and no matter whether you're in politics or what you're doing. Sure. Thank you for that, Bob. Sure. I, and uh, um, that, that common space, at least in the gun, gun issue, and I, somebody uh, who I know works a lot in suicide partly because her husband committed suicide with a gun and I said, gun violence prevention. She said, oh, God, that's social, social science-y. Mm -hmm. And that just takes people out of the conversation. But I think the common ground is that the um, commitment to safety is a commitment to safety. Well, how can we be safe? How can we be safe? And a lot of people say, well, we need to take guns away. Other people say, no, 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 we need the guns to keep us safe. And if you're in Alaska, uh, and the police are 45 miles away, or, you know, uh, um, what are you going to do? And I, I hear this a lot. And that needs to be honored. That needs to be heard. And uh, um, so I think there, there are places in, um, in that mandorla that we need to find, that we need to find. But, but, but that methodology is a truth, and no matter what you do. Absolutely. It's a giant key. Absolutely. It's gun safety. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, no, no. I, um, all the hot button issues, I think it, it works um, all of that way. Yeah. Yes, stand up, please. I'm, I'm Rich Dufresne. I had a little shorter commute on Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the trends or patterns I've noticed is I, I think it's, it's very important to think about language mm -hmm. and, and the words you choose and just the dialogue that you terms of certain words, certain phrases, what does it trigger one's mindset, and to pause and have those conversations to sort it out. Then there's others who would say, oh, we're working so hard to be politically correct. And I think it's, you know, in my, my life's work, it's helping people think about things in a way that they can expand their understanding and, and, and coming from a place of curiosity and openness yeah. to learn. And the language we use, it just that will just trigger mindsets and, 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 and you know an avalanche of biases that we don't even know we're aware of that yes. we're carrying. So I think it's worth the effort, even though folks are like, it's too much work to be thinking mm -hmm. politically correct. Right. But it's also it's not about being politically correct. It's about being able to expand how we understand and see ourselves and see each other. Yes. So we can move forward. So yeah, and to see each other. Um, is, is uh, related to one another in humanity. I, to that point, um, I was at the end of high school, beginning of college, and the language changed around race. Uh, it used to be the term Negro, and then it became black, and then it's African American, Afro American, and uh, you know, all the change. But for me, 
when it was explained to me why the language was changing, because Negro had a, a subservient sort of implication to it, uh, the change in language changed my thinking. It changed, it changed the way I looked at everything. And I, so I've been very careful about language. And that guy who slapped me on the wrist, no, no, don't say gun control. Uh, and I haven't slapped people on the wrist, but I have said to people, please don't use that term. Uh, because it just, it just reinforces the division. It just reinforces the division. And the division is real. And if there's anything we can do to minimize it and to bring people together, uh, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. Thank you. Who's next? Don't be shy. Yes, stand up, please. So, um, I'm the infamous Bob Beck. <laughs> <laughs> I promise not to throw any tomatoes, but I would like to kind of put you on the spot in that, from my perspective, you only touched on political polarization. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, political polarization is currently at the heart of, Amer of America's problems. And guns, abortion, states' rights, all these things are, are both symptoms of and causes of political polarization. And the question I have for you is, do you see the current political polarization getting worse, particularly going into the 2024 election? And yeah. if so, if yes, why? Uh, you know, it, it all depends on who you talk to. Um, what's heartening to me is that Braver Angels is growing, and uh, next summer we hope to have a, uh, a conference, which we haven't been able to have because of COVID, bringing partners in. And there are lots of bridge-building organizations in America. Uh, Resetting the Table, which is based in the Jewish community. One America, which works with uh, um, uh, congregations in the more evangelical community, National Institute for Civil Discourse. And there's a desire to work together uh, to bring people uh, together because the problem is getting worse. It is getting worse, and uh, it, it seems. And people are saying things now that uh, we couldn't imagine being said uh, uh, before. And uh, uh, a classmate of mine, um, I'll age myself, I'm about ready to go to my 50th uh, college reunion, and, and uh, the guy who's organizing, um, uh, that puts me older than some and a lot younger than others, but anyway, he's, he's organizing a panel, and he, he uh, wrote to um, our classmates who are academics, and have been academics for a long time, and said, would you be on a panel uh, of academics, speech then, and speech now? And they all wrote back and said, no. <laughs> said, I don't want to expose myself. To, and, and many of them are retired. Uh, to saying something that somebody's going to take and run with and uh, toilet paper my house or worse. Um, and that's sort of where we are as a culture. And, uh, and so there's permission for it. And you could you know, look around the landscape and why is that? Social media gives people platforms to, to say stuff that they probably wouldn't say face to face. And, and uh, there are public figures who say things that 10 years ago uh, would, would not have been allowed or they would have been in, disinvited. But you know, now, uh, again, conflict on entrepreneurs, anger on entrepreneurs, and they make a lot of money because it, I don't know about you, uh, there are all sorts of public figures in our culture who live in my psyche. And I don't want them there. And I can't get them out. Um, actually, I, I'm get doing better and, and prayer is a way of helping to get them out. I'm turning it over to God and maybe they, God can take care of this because I can't. And uh, these people who just reside in my psyche. And we all, you know, I'm not the only one there. And, and, and it can get um, uh, a prompted careful with my verbs here, um, prompted very easily. And, and that's exactly the intent of the people who use this wild and, and aggressive and, and uh, um, uh, just scurrilous language. In the rear, if you'll just stand up, please. Hi, Chairman Jerry Marlboro. 
just for the record, I think you're a very young man. <laughs> <laughs> I am three weeks older than he is. <laughs> instances of Brave Rangers that found what that common ground is, because I think examples really help me understand the good that this is doing and, and how people can reach common ground. Because sometimes I look at groups and I, I can't imagine how they could even get to that place. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it needs to be said that Braver Angels and groups like it are self-selecting. So that's self-selecting. I mean, people who come to Braver Angels from a red side and a blue side, uh, have a desire to have things be different. So we're two thirds of the way there uh, with that. People come with a, a, a willingness to engage in facilitated conversation, uh, co conversations which um, assure people that they will be safe, provided that uh, you on, uh, uh, honor certain norms, you don't excoriate people, you don't uh, otherize somebody else and uh, so and people will get called out if that happens and it doesn't happen that often but and, and there are lots of people on other en on, on both ends of the of the bell curve who don't want to do that who don't want to do that um, interestingly enough uh, common ground we're talking about I was talking about this on the way over here um, uh, I wrote about this recently about uh, about changing gun culture I think it needs to happen in the gun culture uh, for the, the culture itself to change. Um, was it 30 years ago? Uh, in a room like this, uh, 30 of you, or 30% of you would be smoking? That doesn't happen anymore. H how did we change, how did that culture get changed? How did that culture get changed? Um, gay and lesbian people, 30 years ago, You've seen the numbers. We now have gay marriage. The Senate reaffirmed it. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, my gay friends, um, I was the only one that they would talk, tell that they were gay. Now people are out, um, and the culture has changed. The culture has changed. And I think in, in that instance, the culture changed because so many people, oh, I have a cousin, I have a neighbor, I have a classmate. Um, they're gay. I, well, I do too, and then it's just sort of, it mushroomed from there, and now it's seen as, as part, uh, not, not that we've solved it, but we've moved a long, long, long way. Um, I'd like to say that we've moved on, on the issue of race. Um, what I'm noticing, two things. One is that some people uh, who are minorities, people of color, are more free to tell their stories uh, in, in, in wider audiences. And at the same time, there are people who say, no, 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 we, we don't want to hear those stories because those stories aren't true. So it's both and. It's both and. Yes, who's next? Please stand right up. Carol Gelbach from Peterborough now, formerly of Jaffrey. And I just really wanted to ask, I can see how bringing people together and sort of um, setting a different tone by using different language and so forth helps. But do you do anything, you diffuse maybe the animosities on either side, but are you actually seeing movement with some of these things? Yeah, are you, Th and, that's and a great the thing question. Is, are you actually still hoping that the people who maybe favor the gun rights are actually going to say, oh yeah, you're right, I see I see my error. No, I don't think that, and that's not what you're trying to do, perhaps. But I, I would like to know about whether or not you're. Yeah, doing yeah. Things. Are we? Um, what, what happens um, with Braver Angels? You have initial conversations in there, depolarizing within, bridging the divide, uh, family conversations, the red blue workshop. There are a bunch of them, and then if people want to take it the next step, they join an alliance, and there's a New Hampshire alliance, and they work on an issue that both sides can agree on. And you can imagine if, if uh, uh, people, uh, 
relatively equal numbers of red and blue people come to a municipality, to, to town city leaders and say, we agree on this, um, that's gonna move something much, much further. Uh, and the other thing to say is, uh, quoting Gandhi, we must become the change we seek. Um, I need to, to pay attention to my arrogance, self-righteousness, and smugness. Um, and, and my temptation to shame someone else. And shaming is a big part of uh, what goes on these days. And I, my experience of people, to people uh, who are talking on the, uh, in the gun rights area um, feel shame. Um, and most of us, I assume, have had moments of when we've been shamed by someone else. And it's one of the worst experiences that anybody can possibly have. And many of us do the shaming without knowing that we're doing it. And uh, if we can scale that back, I think we've made a, made a big improvement. Do we have any chat line inquiries? All right, one more question or comment. Yes. Um, Heather Peterson from Peterborough. Oh my goodness. Oh, hi, Sold our house, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, you had talked about how on the north side of, uh, of Chicago, you know, you learned your prejudice and Ned talked about his in um, New London and so forth like that. And as part of this conversation of education, I mean, you talked about why that was so young that those were formed. So as part of this um, opening up of minds and bringing common ground, we, I think we have to start young. And I've been um, a little bit uh, in, um, used to, schools were asked to be everything and now they're mm. not allowed to do anything. I mean, one of these comes is the, what you, on the, the gun safety mm -hmm. issue. Um, the principal of the Peterborough Middle School um, who was a military man, and my husband who was a target shooter, and a pediatrician who was a hunter, and another man who was a suicide hotline worker, wow. gave wow. a gun safety program wow. to all middle school wow. students. Wow. But, but now, you know, not, not allowed anymore. I mean, you know, you can't give sex education, bully education, yeah, you know, yeah. you can't give any of that. Sure. And of course, middle, or drug prevention, yeah. um, which yeah. is middle school is the really crucial age. So how do, how do we reach before, I mean, the family idea is great, but yeah. how, how, how do we reach this? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, we just, we keep working at it. Um, <laughs> and, and hold on to hope. And my favorite definition of hope is from Jim Wallace, who's a um, founder of the Sojourners Community in Washington, D.C., and uh, a prominent evangelical progressive who's written, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. And uh, there are days when I, I just say, I I'm done. Um, I'm done, this is too hard, too hard. But then I find other people who are still at it and uh, want to make change and um, and yeah we need to engage kids at a young age if we can and okay if if this is uh, not a pathway that we have now is there another way to come at it and just to keep thinking and to keep organizing and reorganizing and and keep working at, at these uh, intractable problems that um, I think with hope and with commitment uh, we can make a difference. Well, the conversation will continue in the reception in a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank everyone, and particularly I want to thank you, Mark. I was going to ask Mark whether he considers himself an idealist, but I decided not to ask. <laughs> I have concluded, Mark, that you are a humanist. Mm. And I hope others have a feeling, as I do, 
as we leave here today of some optimism in the face of evidence to the contrary <laughs> because when you referred to what it was like 30 years ago, many of us smoking, members of the gay and lesbian community largely in the closet, not accepted. You know, it's a remarkable thing. Can you believe that a bipartisan group of senators have federalized gay and interracial marriage? And Senator Schumer comes out and mentions the fact, oh yes, he has a daughter who's married to a woman. He and I share that. And that's now fine. So you've made me feel more optimistic and I can't tell you how grateful I am to you for coming here. Thank you, Thank Mark. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now next, next month, you know, in a way, we were dealing with social or moral uh, environmental issues. A month from now, we're going to deal with physical environmental issues. Steve Walker, whom many of you know, uh, will be our speaker. He's someone who started up the pellet company. I can't remember the name of it. Thank you. And is now engaged in an environmental startup. It'll be great. So please, January 6th, come back and thanks again. Thank you.